Steve, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thank you for having me on. Thank you. We've got a lot of common interests. You're an expert in the psychology of social media, spread of misinformation and group biases. And I like what we were talking about earlier off camera, working with colleagues who you might disagree with politically and in your data, you see a lot of, on one hand, there's polarization that everyone focuses on. But if you look at the data, most people are kind of more moderate and you see on social media, it's driven by these extreme yeah. minorities, right? And, the, and you've done a bunch of work on these, like showing different biases that sort of exaggerate how much people think polarization is actually happening. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. Um, I, I would say that I came into um, my interest in social media and studying digital technologies and everything came from just a general interest in uh, political polarization and how polarized we are in the United States and also how polarized many countries are globally. I would say I'm broadly interested in intergroup conflict and uh, especially sort of as it relates to social identity theory and some of these classic theories in social psychology about intergroup relations. Um, and I think nowadays, if you're studying intergroup relations and polarizations, it's really hard to ignore the influence of social media. Um, so uh, more than like 5 billion people around the world are on social media, and that number has been going up rapidly. I know in our papers from a few years ago, we were like, more than 4 billion people are on social media. And now we have to constantly mm -hmm. update that figure and it's projected to be higher and higher. And uh, as you look at some of the younger generations, especially uh, Generation Z, um, the uh, second youngest generation, I guess Gen Alpha is the youngest generation now. Right. But if you look at Gen Z, they're spending on average more than four hours per day on social media. So I think when you're looking at intergroup dynamics, it's really hard to ignore social media. That's where we get our news. That's where we get our information. That's where we learn about social norms and about our in-group norms. It's where we learn about our out-group and everything. Um, and as you just mentioned, it seems like there are some biases in the information that we get from social media. Uh, one of my first papers on... Um, social media dynamics was a paper called Outgroup Animosity Drives Engagement on Social Media in the journal PNAS. And it looked at political conversations on social media, both by U.S. politicians and uh, the U.S. political media. And it broadly found that posts were much more likely to go viral if they mentioned the outgroup as opposed to mentioning anything else or mentioning the in-group. Just mentioning the outgroup was basically the biggest predictor of virality in these data sets. And usually the outgroup was mentioned in a very negative light. Hence the title, Outgroup Animosity Drives Virality on Social Media. We found that it was basically one of the biggest predictors of virality. Uh, specifically, adding an additional outgroup word to a social media post led to about a 70% increase in the number of shares and retweets that post received. And mentioning an outgroup was highly related to angry reactions on Facebook, as well as haha -ha reactions probably indicating outrage and mockery. Um, so we saw these dynamics on social media such that uh, the algorithms on social media or user behavior tends to amplify uh, posts that express outrage or negativity or outgroup animosity. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, there's this dynamic where it seems that extremists are posting a lot on social media, but moderates are really posting uh, we had a follow-up study where we looked at just a general sample of United States participants, and we asked them, what do you think goes viral on social media, and what do you think should go viral on social media? And broadly, what we found is that most people seem to be aware that outgroup animosity and negativity and moral outrage were all going viral on social media, as the research suggests. But this more general sample of just, you know, representative sample of United States participants did not want this to be the case. Most people don't want out-party animosity and moral outrage and negativity to go viral. And some follow-up studies conducted uh, by colleagues, for instance, one, uh, one uh, researcher, Gordon Hetzel, um, found in currently unpublished research, and it's in his thesis, in this experimental study that political extremists have this preference for out-party animosity but moderates don't have this preference. They actually prefer 
in party favoritism. And he also found that political extremists are much more likely to post on social media. So it seems like part of this uh, dynamic of why out party animosity goes viral is there is this group of highly vocal extremists who are really dominating the conversation on social media. And we might infer that social media, that, you know, the norm is to be highly negative about the outgroup when it's really just this small percentage of people. You called this a paradox of virality where yeah. most people really don't like it. And yet, if you look at what happens and what they do, they continue to share the things that make them angry. Yeah, no, I, exactly. And we, we referred to this as a paradox of virality. And this kind of came in response to um, there were some responses to my initial ar uh, article, How Party Animosity Drives Engagement on Social Media, where a lot of people said like, oh, this is just people. People suck. People like outrage. People like uh, derogating the outgroup. This is just people's true preferences. And um, uh, I've, uh, Facebook also wrote a response to our article. That they, they didn't like this article. Uh, and they wrote sort of a defensive response on their research blog. And uh, one of the things they said in their article is that, like, conversations on social media are emotional and polarizing because people out in the world are emotional and polarizing. And it seems that just social media is like a reflection of what's happening in society. That was their argument. They were arguing that social media doesn't really cause polarization. It's just really a reflection of what's happening in society. But that didn't seem to be the case when you looked at our survey data. You found that most people said that they you know, they didn't want out party animosity and incivility to go viral. And this finding generally has been replicated by other researchers. Uh, there's work by Jeremy Freimer showing that um, people don't like when their politicians are uncivil, even if it's politicians from their own party. So Democrats don't like when Democratic politicians are uncivil. Republicans don't like when Republican politicians are uncivil. People don't like when the news is too negative. But uh, you see this sort of disconnect between people's stated preferences of what they want to see and social media behavior. And we think this paradox of virality is driven by a few key things. Uh, one potential explanation is that um, uh, basically a small number of extremists are dominating the conversation on social media. I think that explains part of the paradox of virality. The people who are posting are not necessarily the same people in these representative surveys who are saying that they don't want out party animosity and negativity to go viral. Um, another potential explanation is that people's stated preferences and revealed preferences differ all the time. So for instance, people say that they might want to like eat a salad or go to the gym every day. People might want to live a healthy lifestyle. They say that in their stated preferences, but their revealed preferences fail to live up to this ideal. Um, and we think that social media might be like that as well. Uh, social media content might be a little bit like junk food. It's um, designed to sort of, um, you know, grab our attention just as junk food is designed to keep us eating, but not necessarily to uh, satisfy us. And social media indeed is an attention economy. Social media platforms have the strong business incentive to create addictive products uh, and to keep us on the platform as long as possible so that they can sell advertising revenue and in some cases sell subscriptions. So we think, you know, part of the explanation might be that, you know, people say that they don't want negativity, but when they see negativity or they see out party animosity, they can't help but um, sort of look just like when you're like uh, driving on the road and there's a car crash on the side of the road and you can't help but like slowing down or looking. Uh, it's a little bit the same thing with out party animosity or negativity. It's not that you like it. It's just that you can't necessarily look away. You can't really control yourself when it's in front of you. Um, and you might also be uh, you might also want to comment or you might also want to share and be like, look how this disgusting thing this politician from my out said or something like that. So we think that's part of the explanation as well. Um, and another part of the explanation might be uh, a case of um, pluralistic ignorance, basically. So uh, as I said before, it seems like extremists on social media are dominating the conversation. So when people go onto social media, they might see a feed filled with people expressing out party animosity and outrage toward their out group. And then someone might, you know, before deciding to share an article or a post on social media, they might think, what will please um, my followers? 
uh, my followers who likely share my political orientation while probably expressing outrage or out party animosity because that's what I see on social media and that's what I see gets likes. And this might be, you know, a false belief, a false social norm. You go to social media and you see all these likes and retweets on out party animosity, but you don't really know that people don't actually like that stuff. Um, and also, uh, there are some social media platforms that are sort of built with a downvote button like Reddit, but others like Twitter that are not. And a lot of people tweet, retweet out of outrage. And you might not know that people are like hate retweeting you. You might just be addicted to the engagement. And I think that's what folks like, uh, I, I sometimes call this phenomenon on Twitter brain. There are a lot of public figures like Elon Musk or Kanye West or Jordan Peterson who've just become really, really polarized on Twitter. And it seems like that happened right after they got a huge following. They, be, they were addicted to like the engagement on social media. Um, so I think some of that might be going on as well. I want to delve into some evolutionary explanations for those latter two ideas, either okay. this social conformity bias or this addiction to negativity. Like I can think of a few different explanations. You mentioned one is an addiction, almost like junk food. Yeah. And there's some similarities there, but maybe a little bit of a mismatch. Because when people talk in an evolutionary psychology context about our addiction to junk food, what they say is something like, in our ancestral environment, fat and sugar were rare and high calorie, good for you to have a strong preference for. And nowadays, we're just not built right. for this environment of hyper processed foods. And there's a little bit of that too, right? So like, I can see definitely how social media doesn't match our ancestral environment whatsoever. Like we grew up, we, we evolved in small tribes, but yeah. I don't necessarily see how even in that tribal context, this negativity bias would be a good thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My, my colleague, Claire Robertson just had a preprint come out. Um, she's in my same lab at NYU. And she writes a lot about evolutionary mismatches between sort of the environment that we evolved in, which you're talking about now, and sort of our current modern day social media environment, and uh, how these mismatches might lead to problems. So as you mentioned, we evolved in these sort of small communities of around, you know, like 100 people, not, not very big. We usually interact with people like us. We wouldn't interact on this global scale. We wouldn't have algorithm mediated communication that we have nowadays. I think that's one big difference. And you also wouldn't have this tendency for just a message to go super viral and be spread around the world. And also, you know, communication was face to face. It wasn't sort of this virtual communication where you could also have an anonymous profile. So there are a lot of evolutionary mismatches. But um, on the idea of like why negativity and why out party animosity might go viral. Um, a lot of scholars have talked about sort of uh, the general negativity bias or the idea that bad is stronger than good. You kind of see this everywhere. This has been a long lasting phenomenon and uh, journalists have been colloquially talking about this phenomena for like, you know, a hundred years. They, they have had the expression, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, journalists have often been aware of this attention economy when writing newspaper articles. I think social media is a bit different and then in social media, everything is a bit amplified. I think it's taking advantage in the attention economy of our negativity bias more. But uh, I think from an evolutionary perspective, it made sense to pay attention to threat as opposed to positive because a threat, uh, something like a snake in the grass, is something that could potentially kill you. And additionally, um, something like um, an outgroup threat might be very, very salient. While, while you might get all these positive feelings from in-group warmth, um, a threat from an outgroup is, again, something that might hurt your chances of survival. So it sort of makes sense for us to have this, you know, negativity bias. It makes sense why this negativity bias evolved and why it might be especially applied to social groups, such as outgroups. So, um, yeah, how I see it on social media is we have these like sort of innate psychological tendencies. We pay more attention to negativity. We pay more attention to outgroup threat. We might pay more attention to moral violations as well. There might be a reason evolutionarily why we might pay more attention to like immoral actors than moral actors. Um, 
So yeah, that's that's an example of why we might attend more to these types of categories. But it seems like social media algorithms take advantage of our evolved predisposition to pay more attention to the negative, pay more attention to outgroup threat, and then they amplify it. Because again, social media is this mm -hmm. attention economy. It's designed to really, you know, grab us our attention, create addicting products. So they take advantage of sort of these evolved predispositions, just like, you know, the creator, the company that creates Doritos takes advantage right. of our attraction to salty or fatty foods. Does this relate to this hedonic treadmill idea? Like mm. if you win the lottery, you're really happy in the short term, and then it just becomes your new normal. And you're basically just as happy as you used to be, if not maybe more unhappy. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have some colleagues who study uh, social media from the perspective of habit. And I think there are these complex dynamics of what happens when you go viral on social media. And I've also experienced this as uh, we can talk about this later, but like as a, mm -hmm. you know, as a psychology TikToker, I make educational psychology TikToks and I've gone super viral at times. And then I've had periods where I don't go viral at all for a year. And I think social media creates sort of weird dynamics there that relate to this hedonic treadmill. It's idea. kind of Pavlovian. It's like this random yeah, reward. Exactly. Yeah, a lot of people have noticed that like social media is like a Skinner box. It has these intermittent reinforcements. You never really know when you're going to have that viral hit tweet or that viral TikTok or whatever. So you're always like constantly waiting for it. And that sort of anxiety about when it will come will make you post more. But uh, there was this cool study that looked at what happened when people go very viral on the app TikTok, which TikTok, uh, because it's so algorithmic, you have the potential to go viral much more rapidly than you are on other platforms like Twitter and Instagram. And they basically found that when people went super viral, they basically started posting a bunch more and they started posting a bunch more of the same content. So basically people were seeking out that reward um, again. Uh, but um, but yeah, I, I, I think it, it also kind of like relates to this like idea of like prediction error. You get this big like positive like prediction error. You're like, oh, I'm super viral. That makes me feel super good. But then you're like, then your prediction errors are negative and you're sort of chasing that reward again. And you're like, will I ever go viral like that again? Uh, and I think this pattern sort of gets you in this um, sort of destructive uh, Skinner box, mm -hmm. like addicted state, essentially. A lot of creators talk about this paradox where they do something, they're doing basically what they want to produce and randomly one of them goes viral and then you try and feed into the crowd's desires. But then... You're not doing necessarily what you want to do. And maybe people can detect in subtle ways whether you're not as passionate. And yeah. it's like the advice they give generally is don't do what other people want. Do what you want. And you kind of get this in academia too. Like mm -hmm. we were talking about the faculty hiring process earlier. And mm -hmm. in our first year, we have this introductory pro seminar where you meet all the different faculty members and they talk about their research and talk about their personal journey. And for the most part, especially the ones who had tenure, they're basically saying, you know, this career is so competitive. You don't know if you're going to get tenure or not. I did my research my way and it worked out and it wouldn't have worked out if I just tried to do what I thought people wanted of me. But then those are the ones who got tenure. So you don't know if there's like a selection bias right. of, is there a population of people who did what they wanted and it didn't work out? Yeah, that's a little bit of like the survivorship bias type of thing. And I mm -hmm. really, I don't know, I feel like I've been, I guess I haven't been in academia that long, but I feel like it's been like, a, you know, a decent amount. I've gone through a PhD in a few years of postdoc, essentially. <laughs> but I don't really know what the best advice is for people. But it is true, something that I have heard from like my mentors early on is really study something that you're passionate about because academia is such a hard world that like you're not really going to have like gonna it's gonna be hard to be motivated if you're not studying your something you're passionate about but you still have to like find this optimal blend of something that you're passionate about and something that other people are passionate about and other people care about and sort of like a generative field that other people will want to build on and cite etc one of my first uh psychology studies was um about the effects of attending live theater on empathy and pro-social behavior and attitudes and it was the series of field experiments that 
found essentially that attending these theater productions um, changed people's attitudes, increased their empathy toward groups depicted in the show, and led to increased pro-social donation behavior. And this study was super fun to run. And I come from a theater background, so it was like mm -hmm. especially rewarding for me. Uh, but it was a little tricky because theater, while it was something too sort of interesting to explore, it's not there aren't as many scholars sort of in the field of like the psychology of theater and the arts as there are sort of nowadays in um, sort of social media, misinformation, intergroup relations. So sometimes you also have to work with a field where there are a lot of like, you know, scholarly debates going on. And that makes it more interesting so you can like build on future work, but it also makes it more practical. But at the same time, mm -hmm. there are risks of studying social media and psychology today. There are a lot of people who don't think that social media is something that's important to study psychologically or they think it's too applied. And, uh, and uh, you see less and less of this, especially from the younger generations who now view social media is super, super important. But there's a lot of backlash to studying social media. So I don't know what the answer is. But I also wanted to talk about this in relationship to uh, TikTok and sort of public communication as well and mm -hmm. sort of the, uh, the balances we have there. Because I have found this as well as... Uh, a TikTok creator. So I've now created educational psychology videos with my TikTok account for three years. I've made like over 200 videos, maybe like 300 videos. So it's, you know, it's been a lot. I've, I've slowed down a bit more recently because I've been very busy. But, um, but yeah, I went through these like cycles. Uh, okay, for instance, I, I think like one to two years ago, I went from like 40,000 followers to um, 900,000 followers within the course of a couple weeks. So I had this like massive viral boost on TikTok that was just like super weird and super unexpected. Like one day I just like gained 150,000 followers overnight and I kind of had no idea why. It was just this weird wow. algorithmic Was thing. this all during COVID or after? Uh, this was in 2021, I think. So I huh. started TikTok during COVID. It was like a 2020... COVID yeah. thing and I was like there in the COVID boom and I think I think my account benefited from the COVID boom it, it was a lot easier to grow in my opinion at least it was easier to grow on TikTok during COVID I think there were just like a lot of people bored at home on the app it was still kind of new it was like a little bit less competitive um so I kind of went there in the COVID boom I think now you see a few more like highly professional creators so it's a little harder mm -hmm. to break through I've also heard that COVID might have been sorry TikTok might have been pushing educational content a bit more a few years ago. They always changed their algorithm. So now they're pushing long form videos a bit more, uh, which I do less of. But but anyway, I yeah. for some reason, I matched up with their algorithm and I have no idea why. But it felt very artificial because it's like, you know, at this point, I had been making TikTok videos for like a year and then I just like blew up. And, uh, you know, I went to like again, two weeks to get to 900,000 followers. And then maybe a couple months later, I, I, I went to over a million. Um, but, but yeah, now I've been sort of stuck at that period, mm -hmm. at that follower count of a million for, you know. Not a bad years, place to be almost. stuck at. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's nice to be there and it's nice to have it there. But, it's, but I went through that cycle of the whole, um, I had this insane boot yeah, this algorithmically. Box. And I've never been able to like achieve that again. And I have no idea why. And it's, you can always sort of blame your content, blame yourself. You can be like, oh, I, for some reason I was tapping into what people like, but, but it's weird. And now I just kind of point to some weird algorithmic randomness, something I hit on the algorithm um, well. But, but yeah, I, I also wanted to talk about how I experienced that as a creator as well. That whole, I, I have sort of this intuition of like, what people will like, what will go viral, and what I really want to talk about. Sometimes I really want to talk about the replication crisis, or I want to talk about, mm -hmm. I, I did a five-minute video about Francesca Gino and that scientific frog case because I thought it was like super interesting and I wanted to tell everyone about it. Uh, or I want to talk about very specific like social media studies, and those don't do quite as well as something that is like very simple and visual. So uh, for instance, some of my most viral uh, videos have been about like uh, the change blindness experiments that come with a video and they're like, oh, mm -hmm. do you notice like what has changed here? Or um, just a lot of developmental psych things about like how uh, babies have a basic sense of morality. And if you show like a baby reacting to the uh, 
puppet or whatever. The good was that some of Ashley Thomas's work? Uh, no, that was Paul Bloom's work on Moral Babies. I do want to do Ashley Thomas's work because the saliva sharing would be cool. I I find that saliva share that's like one of my favorite papers I've come across. It's the finding is so um, so so cool. Yeah, no, I I definitely want to do something on that. But yeah, people are really interested in uh, babies' developmental psychology and. Ironically, they're less interested in like social media and what I study. So I'm always like, okay, I'll do a few of these videos that I like, and then I'll do a few of these videos that other people like. But it's this like mm-hmm. delicate balance. And you don't want to like fall like prey to the trappings of the algorithm because like I also know that like if I get a little bit more polarizing or whatever, maybe I I do better. Uh and there have been some psychologists who have benefited from um so there's a lot of psychology misinformation on TikTok, for instance, and some uh, psychology creators have gone very viral for fact checking this uh, misinformation. But often this starts feud uh-huh. between the creators who like create the misinformation and it becomes this big like thing and then it gets eyeballs because it's so polarizing. And it's just like I as someone who studies polarization on social media, I want to stay away from that and not fall into the trappings of like becoming someone who has polarized myself because the algorithm encourages me to be that. Do you mean like studies that existed but didn't replicate and that's misinformation? Or do you mean like completely non-scientific? Oh, like I mean, Myers-Briggs astrology type stuff. Yeah. If you look at the most viral psychology content uh, for a while. Sorry, recovering from a bit of a cough. But if you look at um, so early on, some of the most viral psychology TikToks were uh, TikToks like what your sleeping position says about you. Uh, so it wasn't based in science at all. It was just, if you sleep on your side, I mean, if you sleep, whatever, something like that, or uh, like 10, uh, things like that, basically. Very like nonsense things. Or like there's a lot of color psychology. Like if you wear blue, people will think you're confident. Just like a lot of basic tips that were so... Yeah, I, there's, I feel like there's a huge problem with media literacy on TikTok. Uh, and uh, I then I don't see as much on some other social media platforms, maybe because I'm in such an echo chamber on social media. But people fact checking that, and then there has been a lot of drama where like creators will react badly to being fact checked. And it's also like as a misinformation researcher, it's an interesting question about what the best way to fact check someone is. Uh, there are some field studies that are conducted by David Rand and colleagues that found that like. If you like reply to publicly to someone who posts misinformation on Twitter to fact check them, this often backfires. They'll post more misinformation and more polarizing content in the subsequent days. So sometimes these like public fact checks of people don't work very well because you put them in like a defensive perspective. They found by contrast that if you like DM someone that uh, that seems to work a bit better. So you don't want to put someone like on the defensive mm-hmm. when fact checking them. But also, it might be beneficial for viewers of the fact check. They might learn a bit from it. Um, so, yeah, interesting questions from like a misinformation researcher perspective. Yeah, there's also an interesting meta science question about why do some types of misinformation work or seem more intuitive? So, like, there's mm-hmm. something about, say, colors or what you wear or how you sleep, mm-hmm. linking that to personality. Like, whether it's true or not, people seem to readily believe that it's true and you could imagine a whole bunch of other things that Mm -hmm. people would just completely dismiss like i don't know what you ate is going to protect your personality but there's a lot of fashion or fashionable health diet thingies that are you know not really grounded in science that go super viral so maybe that's not the best example but you know some things you can just completely dismiss as not remotely plausible and something like, well, maybe your personality says something about the way you dress and people can pick up on that. There's like an intuitive psychology there. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting. I, I have a few thoughts on that. Um, so, yeah, there's sort of this kind of like classic study. Well, classic as in it was in 2018, but by Sinan Ra, one of the most cited misinformation studies found that like fact checked falsehoods on Twitter spread farther and wider and faster than fact checked true claims on Twitter. Um, so some studies, not all studies, show that misinformation often has an advantage over truth in terms of like its stickiness, its spreadability, its virality. And why is that? It, it seems that misinformation sort of has this benefit over true content in that it can 
appeal to like our psychological tendencies that make stuff go viral. Whether that's like, I talked about how outgroup animosity goes viral. It could be misinformation that paints your outgroup in a very bad light. And that's a very common type of misinformation that we see. It, it could be an expression of moral outrage. Uh, my um, colleague, Killian McLaughlin, he has work on how like moral outrage is associated with misinformation spreading, basically. So it could have moral outrage. It could be emotional. It could talk about an outgroup. Or as you talked about, it could like appeal to like our personal characteristics, our identity characteristics. Um, there's some work uh, by Jonah Berger showing that uh, on Kindle, we're more likely to highlight passages in book that have the pronoun you in it. So if a book says like, you might benefit from mm -hmm. this, or you might blah, 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 people are more likely to highlight it. So people seem to be really interested in like information that will tell them something about themselves. So I think people are super interested in like what might Person, what my sleeping position says about me or what my Myers-Briggs might say about me. It, it's really interesting why like the Myers-Briggs personality test has like taken off so much in comparison to like these validated tests like the Big Five, for instance. The Big Five right. gets no traction. And it seems to be that the Myers-Briggs sort of assigns you conveniently into types. Like an, I'm an INFJ. Hmm. I am the listener uh, or whatever, basically. Uh, you can sort of hmm. identify with... Um, a group and um yeah there's there's also um there's also some uh i mean a lot of my work looks at how like identity drives virality online content that appeals to our identity characteristics seems to go viral whether that's outgroup animosity or whether that attracts us to learning something about our in-group um so uh the website um buzzfeed the new site buzzfeed which was you know pretty popular like five to 10 years ago, very popular amongst millennials, I guess we'll say, um, they noticed that like identity related content always seemed to go viral online. Uh, so um, they, they found that headlines like uh, 10 things that you'll only know if you're like left-handed or 20 things only anxious people will understand. So basically like stuff that appeals to like, this is like your in-group and this is something that you'll only know if you're in your in-group that makes you kind of feel like you're part of a special in-group seem mm -hmm. to go viral according to BuzzFeed. And they found this both for like trivial identities, like being left-handed, as well as more like complex identities, like race and gender identities. And then there was some follow-up work uh, that was actually empirical work uh, uh, recently published um, in the American Journal of Political Scientists by some political scientists where they analyzed... Um, sort of what people tended to click on on the news site Upworthy and what went viral on Facebook. And they indeed found that like content went viral or people clicked on content more if it referenced an identity category. So content that sort of reference a racial identity category, a gender identity, a religious identity, um, or other identities, they created this like BERT classifier that would sort of classify whether a headline reference of identity all this identity related content seemed to be clicked on more. And also they found that over the past 10 years, like identity related content has been increasing over time, sort of in the news media and on Facebook, et cetera. People will talk about sort of feminism or being LGBTQ or being Christian or being Republican or whatever. That seems to be increasing over time. And it seems to be driven in part by the sort of attention economy and what mm -hmm. we attend to is identity. So this is sort of a really interesting thing where like we might talk about identity a lot more. We might sort of be in this age of people talk about identity politics or where we're always like talking about identity categories. And that might be because of social media and because of the social media attention economy and because identity related content captures our attention, basically. You know, it's at least anecdotally often driven by this more negativity bias because when i click mm -hmm. on something like that it's not necessarily because i genuinely think that there's some insider knowledge that i'm going to gain you know if they say a quick baby thing like eight things only people from california will understand i'm from california <laughs> i look at it and usually i'm determined to prove them wrong i'm like no way these aren't important here's what i would really put but it, oh, but it still see. gets me to click right even if i'm yeah they're wrong well that's the thing about 
clickbait, basically. Uh, we had an article in the Boston Globe, just like an op-ed piece called Why We Click on Stuff We Don't Like. And it sort of dealt with the paradox of virality and like why, w yeah, why we do what you did there. Why we like still click on something that we, we don't like. And it seems like clickbait is that like represents the paradox of virality very well. And that it's stuff we really don't like, but stuff that we're like, oh, okay, we have to click on it. And Clickbait really succeeded on social media. I know that social media algorithms are trying to limit it a bit well, but there are ways that people always get around those algorithms now. So, This intuition that you talked about earlier of you can frame things a certain way that you think will get you more views compared to what you really want to talk about that might be less fashionable. Does it actually work? Do you see that in your view counts? Eh. You mean like, are there certain ways I can present ideas that will get people to like? Yeah, or even more? the types of ideas. Like if you're talking yeah. about one of your own empirical studies versus something, you know, more basic or common knowledge. Yeah, I, I mean, having like made like 200 plus of these like little videos, I think I've developed a little bit of like a, a formula in terms of like what works for me for like presenting an idea in a way that will get people to watch. I mean, what you're trying to do on TikTok is you're trying to like maximize watch time, essentially. So having a really good mm -hmm. hook seems to be like the number one thing that matters. And again, this is all anecdotal. I don't really have like data on like, I mean, I have my analytics, but I like, I can't really like prove any of this stuff besides like what I've learned over time. But it seems that like having a really good hook matters. And a hook that like doesn't reveal the full purpose of what you're talking about uh, I, I guess it has that logic of clickbait a little bit. Although the thing about mm -hmm. clickbait is it often presents, it has a really good hook and it presents something disappointing. What you want to do is you have, you want to have a good hook that doesn't reveal everything, but that gets people watching. And then you present something that pays off at the end. Um, so that, that's something that I do. I, I mean, the way you talk also matters, I think, on TikTok. Something that I've seen about like highly viral TikTok creators is that they talk in a way that's like almost annoying, but that keeps you watching. So I, I there are some highly yeah. viral educational creators who are like, oh my God, this study found blah, blah, blah. Like they talk, like they're incredibly exuberant. They talk really, really quickly, but it gives you the sense of urgency where you're like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, like I have to watch this. And, and sometimes I think it can be taken a bit too far. You don't want to like leave the... um the viewer disappointed but i find that like it's helpful for me to like convey authentic excitement about what i'm talking about and to like be animated and present right so it's helpful to be animated i i don't want to be animated in an inauthentic way but i come from a theater background so it's not too hard for me to be animated uh -huh. and i am excited about what i'm talking about so i would say that helps so i again the hook being animated um not going into too much detail is like something that's pretty important because a lot of people who are watching don't have any background in like statistics. They don't know what statistically significant is. There's there's just like a lot of stuff where you have to present yourself as accessible to like a general audience. And that can be hard as a scientist to really kind of code switch to go from the scientific way of talking to like, how can I present this to someone who's never even heard of psychology before i get a lot of questions like mm -hmm. what is psychology what is an in-group in my comments and i'm like oh okay i didn't make this simple enough to be understood by a broad audience and occasionally the algorithm will send more complex videos to people who can understand it and send more simple videos like there's some algorithmic thing but your really viral videos will be simple things and then the final thing is something visual whether that's um there have been some viral videos i've made where i have been like making like iced coffee while talking and that has been like pretty successful a lot of creators mm -hmm. like put put on makeup while they're talking and one time i used like iced coffee like so i saw these videos on tiktok where people made these like absurdly large iced coffees with like so much sugar and caramel and whipped cream and i was like why like why why can i not stop watching these like absurd iced coffee videos and i was like okay I'm going to make an absurd iced coffee and I'm going to use it as a metaphor for like my research on what goes viral on social media and why stuff we don't like goes viral because 
I don't necessarily like watching people make these absurd iced coffees, but I can't look away because I'm like, why are you doing that? Why are you making that absurd iced coffee? So I was like, OK, I'm going to make an absurd iced coffee. I'm going to make it sort of a metaphor for my research. And that did well. So something visual that you're either doing huh. or showing like a figure or a picture from the study to like illustrate the psychological phenomena works well. Or, or again, sometimes there are like videos of psychology experiments that you can include. And while you're talking, you can kind of show the video. Um, so for the Moral Babies work by Paul Bloom, there were videos of like a baby watching a good and a bad puppet. So people had something to watch while they were watching me. So that helps mm -hmm. as well. So that's that's sort of what I've learned over time. But uh, the algorithm doesn't like my account anymore. So this could all be uh, this could all be wrong. Basically, it, it, it's so hard to like know what goes viral. Uh, but yeah, those are some of my tips. The coffee example is interesting. You often see people, it's usually like cooking or even laundry, mm -hmm. like some sort of house busy work while mm -hmm. they're narrating about something that often has nothing to do with the thing that they're recording. And I can think of two reasons for that. I mean, one is this uh, ASMR stuff, which I don't really get, but yeah, a lot of people seem either. to like that. I don't know if it's like yeah. an OCD thing because, mm -hmm. you know, like especially the listening to people chewing, I think it's disgusting, yeah. but a lot of people find it calming apparently. So I don't get that. But Maybe that's driving some of the effect. And then another, it could be almost this like camaraderie about if you're yeah. just hearing from this detached scientific expert, maybe it, it doesn't feel as nice as if it's like, oh, you're in their house, you're watching them make breakfast. Like, it's kind of like you're just having a conversation like a podcast. Yeah, I think there's something about like people who can create a parasocial relationship dynamic that is like really compelling. And I would say some of the best I would say this often applies to like podcast hosts. I would say that the best podcasts often like you kind of feel that parasocial connection with them. You feel like it's just like two friends talking, like you're kind of like in a conversation almost with them. So people who are able to like create those parasocial dynamics seem to do really well. And I could see doing an activity is something that makes it like casual because you're making like a, a matcha or something and folding laundry. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're invited into their place. I will say that when I have filmed my like iced coffee videos, like I will like spill my coffee between takes. It's it's so like not casual <laughs> when I'm actually trying to do it. It's so like prepared and rehearsed. Um, but yeah, I think another thing is also this like desire for completion. There's this thing called like the Zygarnik effect in psychology that things like stick in our memory more if they're like unfinished, basically. Um, and then we'll forget things more easily if they're finished. So I think there's this thing where if like someone starts putting on makeup or if someone starts an iced coffee, you just have this desire to watch it till the end. You're mm -hmm. like, oh, I wonder where that's going to go. Or like, oh, I'm and a lot of people comment on my videos and we're like, oh, I, I didn't listen to you the first time because I was just watching the coffee. So then <laughs> I had to like watch again to get the content. And it's like, that's good for the algorithm. Right. You know, those old school VCR things where like there's a little shape bouncing around the corners of the old school television and oh, you're just yes. waiting for it to hit the corner. <laughs> I love watching those. Wow. Okay. That's like, and one there's of those, something like... dissatisfying about when it's like, it seems like it's going to go. It just misses. Yeah. Sometimes people edit things like that just to frustrate you. And I wonder if that yeah. drives views as well. There are those accounts called like oddly satisfied and oddly dissatisfying. Have you seen those? Right. Like where uh -huh. the oddly satisfying, like things like line up perfectly. And then the dissatisfying is like, you think it's going to line up perfectly. And then it doesn't. And it's so like frustrating. And for some reason, those are both like, like I, I can't stop watching both of those. Someone needs to study like the psychology of yeah. that. I'm sure I think it, it connects to, to like... the prediction error thing we were talking about. Oh, yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. And desire for completion and desire for. Yeah. Do you know John Deloney, counseling psychologist? Um, I don't think I do. No. He's my favorite counseling psychologist. He's got a pretty big social media following. It's it's mostly YouTube. And he hosts this show almost like Dr. Phil style. It's usually listeners calling in and asking about advice, whether with family or relationships. Mm -hmm. And he gives really practical but evidence-based advice. And we did a podcast mm -hmm. a while ago. Mm -hmm. He's also into evolutionary theory and neuroscience. And we were talking about why podcasts have blown up in the last decade mm -hmm. or so. And one thought is just like, well, you can listen to audiobooks and it's consuming information passively. and you have more free time to listen than you do to read because you can do it while you're driving or yeah. while you're doing dishes, just random things like that. 
But then we also talked about this evolutionary sitting around a campfire idea, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. again, if you think about this mismatch, historically, it's been impossible to listen to someone talk for an hour or longer or really any mm -hmm. period of time mm -hmm. if you're not there with them intimately. And even as a listener, even if you're not able to speak, plenty of times you can be around a couch or a campfire just listening to people and you feel close to them, even if you're not necessarily contributing. Plus, in your mind, you're still maybe even pausing the conversation and thinking of a thing you want to contribute, even if not directly yeah. to the host, although you could email them. I think both of us are accessible. You can text your friend like, oh, you got to listen to this clip. So mm -hmm. there's something intensely social about it. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, I'm someone needs to do a study on the parasocial dynamics with podcasts because on the podcast versus audiobooks uh, question, um, mm -hmm. I used to like listen to audiobooks a lot and I used to love them. Again, I find like less and less time to read. It's like a little harder. So I would try to listen to audiobooks, but then I would always find myself just wanting to listen to the author of the audiobook talk on a podcast instead of the audiobook because the audiobook felt too rehearsed. It was too precise. It was like a narrator. Whereas I wanted to hear this like naturalistic discussion from the author. You get a sense. It's both more like succinct. Although like, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I sometimes have this like attention span for like three hour podcasts because I love, I, I just would like, like to hear someone's thought process and to hear the pauses and to hear them thinking through things. And yeah, again, it seems to fulfill those social needs in a sense. So it'd be interesting to do a study to see whether like listening to a long form podcast, people feel like their social needs are fulfilled in a sense, because it is like you're hanging out with friends, but it's just not, you're not contributing. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think a final point, I, I listen a fair amount to like Ezra Klein's podcast. And I know he said once that like, he feels like so when people like reach out to them him when friends like reach out to him they they don't feel like a need to catch up with him because they feel like they've already heard about his life through the podcast like it's this like one-sided relationship has been refilled mm -hmm. but like Ezra's like oh but I haven't heard about your life so it's the sense that just through like listening to him on the podcast they like they've already hung out basically they don't need to like catch up um, mm -hmm. And there was this really cool nature paper that uh, this phenomenon reminded me of and has to do with parasocial relationships, which um, this is one of the most bizarre findings I've like heard of in psychology. And it's the finding that when you know something about another, when you know more about another person, you feel like they know more about you, which is really bizarre. Uh, so uh -huh. basically, like, they, they did all these MTurk studies. They did a field experiment as well. And they'd like tell people, they'd either like keep this person anonymous or they'd tell pe someone a lot of facts about this other person. And then they'd ask, how well do you think this person knows you? And of course, this person never met the participant. But when they knew more about the other person, they felt like the other person knew them. And their explanation for this really weird finding is essentially that like in, again, sort of like in like evolutionary campfire dynamics or whatever, when you knew something about another person, it was always sort of a bi-directional relationship. Like these one directional relationships are a little bit new. So we kind of have this like flawed heuristic that when you know a lot about someone else, it's you kind of feel like they know you back. Um, mm -hmm. I bet there's polarization research on that because you could think if someone shares your politics, for example, then oh, yeah. they'll know other things about you because maybe you have other yeah. personality traits in common. But even if they're the exact opposite, you might also mm -hmm. think other things are opposite. So the prediction would be if you're more moderate, it's harder for people to connect with on both ends, even though ironically, right. you would think if you're moderate, there'd be more to connect with on both sides. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And that could explain a little bit. There has also been this sort of bizarre psychological phenomena called like acrophily. So um, people, uh, well, homophily is well known in psychology and soci sociology. We're attracted to like-minded others. But I mean, Goldenberg and colleagues find that we also like have this acrophily. We're attracted to like political extremists, basically, of our own side. So like if you're left, you're attracted to someone a little bit more leftist than you. If you're right, you're attracted to someone a little bit more right-leaning with you. And yeah, it's unclear why that is. It could be a little bit like 
they have a sense of certainty or you're more certain about them. You kind of like know that they're like, okay, I like know who they are as a leftist. Whereas like a moderate, you don't like really know. They're like a little shady, you know, they could be a little bit of one side, a little bit of another. They're flip flopping. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's strange because I think I'm more moderate and I like other moderates for those reasons because, mm -hmm. you know, knowing one thing about you shouldn't necessarily predict other things, but you're right that it kind of just reduces or increases prediction error. It makes the world more complicated. In general, mm -hmm. you have to expend more cognitive effort. People don't like that. I think this yeah. is partially why people like Steve Pinker are controversial because I don't, I don't really see it. Like if you, if you talk to him, he's a lovely yeah. guy. And yeah. if you look at his Twitter feed, he's often posting these enlightenment things of like 50 ways the world is getting better. And it's like a bunch of different graphs and statistics about, you know, like child mortality going down, mm -hmm. education going up, all these things that I think connects to this negativity bias we were talking mm -hmm. about earlier, because mm -hmm. for some reason that doesn't really make news. It's almost like people mm -hmm. are controlling for that. They're like, yeah, but that was going to happen anyway. This negative thing didn't have to happen. So we need to direct all our attention there. Yeah, no, I've been puzzled by the response to um, Enlightenment now in some of some of like uh, Stephen Pinker's like charts and stuff, because it should be pretty like uncontroversial. You're just presenting statistics that the world is getting better in all these ways, which a lot of people aren't aware of. And that's a surprising mm -hmm. phenomenon that a lot of people are not aware of how rapidly the world has gotten better over the best like 100 years and like why being born now is like the best time to be alive and again that's so different from what you see on uh for instance like your your tiktok feed a lot of my tiktok feed you know it's a lot of people um who will be like gen z and they'll be very it, it, it's sort of this doomeristic perspective especially about things like climate change climate doomerism mm -hmm. and um it's true that like you know climate change it's a it's a really significant problem that we like need to tackle but it's always sort of this doomer perspective that goes really viral. Yeah. And this doesn't seem to be a very productive perspective from psychological research. Uh, some studies have shown that this doomer perspective backfires. I mean, one big like mega study um, that just came out by Madalena Vlaschanu, Judge J. Van Babel, Kim Dowell, it found that basically uh, like an intervention that talked about climate doomerism led people to want to post more about climate change on social media, but actually like decrease their like intentions to engage in climate action. So I, you know, these mm -hmm. ways that like these things that capture our attention, like climate doomerism and these very like negative uh, feelings about the world or this perception that things are, are hopeless, they go super viral, but it doesn't really, um, yeah, accord with some of the data about how the world is getting better. But, um, but yeah, I, it's it's also a complex dynamic. I know that there were some. I haven't really gone into the criticisms of the um, like Stephen Pinker's work recently, but I know that like a bunch of historians or something wrote like long mm -hmm. rebuttals about ways that the world is actually getting worse, and there are indeed ways uh -huh. the world is getting worse. I and mean, one way is like this increase in polarization and democratic backsliding against like in a lot of the world, and it could be that we were sort of in a peaceful period and like un like unexpectedly peaceful period for a long time. And now mm -hmm. we're like returning a bit to a period of polarization. I would say certainly things in like American politics have been getting much worse. So it does, it, it does matter what you pay attention to. But again, on these basic factors like child mortality that we don't talk about and like healthcare and like, yeah, progress has gotten much, much better. So it's similar to this nature nurture question. It's like, it's always some combination of mm -hmm. both. You know, I don't know if I'm more of a pessimist, but when I think about mm -hmm. climate change, even though it's relative to like what we could be doing, we're not doing mm -hmm. much. I think like we didn't even really know this was a thing like 50 years ago. And in 50 years, which right. is blink of an eye in human evolutionary history, we've m done massive globalized like cooperation and change. Even yeah. again, even if it's failing relative to this ideal, I wonder where people get that ideal to compare to it's kind of related to another bias you see on social media like this usually it's about body image or like people's social lives you know like you're posting yeah. your highlight reel and people compare their own lives including all the Life. mundane stuff to that but it's not a realistic comparison no no um yeah and i mean 
a lot of the research on like social media and well-being shows that particularly for like adolescent girls, social media is really, really bad for like well-being and body image and everything, especially on like Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, partially because what is amplified on Instagram is people with sort of perfect bodies and everything. And that's that's very hard, I think, for the changing brain. Um, but mm -hmm. um, what is you said two things. You also said something about climate change as well, right? So you're only disappointed if mm -hmm. you're comparing whatever, whatever you're comparing your expectations to, if your expectations exceed the reality. And, yeah. you know, the extreme take would be, well, if you have low expectations, you're always satisfied. Now, you don't yeah. want to be like a grumpy pessimist, positively surprised by every s slight little thing. Right, but, right, right. You know, there's some benefit to having those lower expectations. It's kind of related to like this mindfulness idea. Yeah, no, I, I certainly think so. And I think if you want to accomplish anything, I mean, like, because because I do agree that the state of climate change is quite dire and scary and obviously a huge problem when you look at it. But yeah, as you said, there has been global cooperation. But I just think the doomeristic perspective perspective is very unproductive if you want to get anything done so i mean who's to say i like i can't predict what's going to happen 20 years in the future i i have no idea what mm -hmm. existential threats are whether it's like nuclear war ai whatever or climate change and there's a lot to be scared about with the future but if you want to like cooperate and move forward you kind of have to have at least like a little bit of optimism and that's certainly not what social media promotes and i think social media is a very biased landscape for uh talking about these issues and an unproductive place to to talk about climate change and i think you also see this in ai as well like there's been so much discussion of ai and like chat gpt and all the advances in ai which are very very exciting um but i would say that the ai doomer perspective is often very viral on social media this whole like artificial mm -hmm. intelligence is like an existential risk that will uh you know uh, super intelligence will destroy us blah 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 I think that perspective has gone really viral on social media. And I think it's because, it, again, it appeals to some of those like uh, psychological things. And I, again, I, I don't know who's to say like who's right on this issue. I just don't think that like social media is always amplifying the best perspectives. You mentioned you used to work with Rob Henderson and he's written a lot about virtue signaling. Do you think any of that connects here in like social status, like the fact that your doomsdaying in some sense there's a moral superiority there you're kind of claiming this is so important you're not paying attention to it but in bringing it up you're mentioning it so there's some sort of moral points there not to say that you can't do this without good intentions but there could be that added layer of virtue signaling that contributes to more of this doomsday message yeah um so on Rob Hebberderson, we were talking about him before uh, the podcast started, but he was my uh, he was my um, office mate uh, at the University of Cambridge during the PhD. And we had like a lot of uh, amazing and interesting discussions. And we were, we were friends during that period. And yeah, again, he's he's talked a lot about virtue signaling. He's talked about so-called like luxury beliefs, like how holding certain beliefs like gives us a sense of status, even if these beliefs are uh, somehow harmful. I think there's certainly some of that going on on social media you know a lot of people have talked about virtue signaling holding beliefs that satisfy your in-group and i think there's a lot of work that shows that people will post content on social media that um they believe their in-group will like we have found in a series of experimental studies that if you motivate people to be accurate through for instance financial incentives people will report intentions to share more accurate content However, if you make people's political identities salient and if you ask people, uh, do you think this piece of content will be liked by members of your political in-group, people will then report greater intentions to share articles that um, are liked by members of their political in-group. And I think there's reason to believe that social media makes our social identities um, particularly salient, basically. We, we're having all these identity-based conversations. And there's also something commonly i see on social media anecdotally is that people are often posting things like uh if you don't speak up on this issue like 
we're listening to you. You're like a terrible person if you don't speak up on this issue. Silence is violence, et cetera. I see that all the time. I see pressure to post like about controversial political issues on social media. But oftentimes if you do actually, if you're like, okay, I will post about this controversial political issue, a lot of people will get mad at you if you post. So it's a little bit like there's nothing mm -hmm. you can really do productively. And I, there's also this common thing I see on social media where people say, like, it's not that complicated. It's like a simple issue. It's, you know, just just post about it, um, even when it often hurts you. So I, I think there is this pressure for some people to um, virtue signal or post things that will be liked by their in-group. And there's so much classic work on conformity in social norms, even going back to like Ash's line test, people will report things that they know are untrue if it if they think it will just please their in-group, basically. So I think there's that going on on social media. But I think another thing is going on as well. And this kind of comes from some unpublished data from uh, my colleague Claire Robertson in my same lab. She finds that uh, the people who post most often about certain political issues, so let's say abortion or let's say like Israel Palestine or certain complex political issues are people who view that issue as very important to them. Uh so oftentimes it's not necessarily virtue signaling. It's oftentimes there are very vocal people on social media who have more extreme opinions who post a lot because those extreme opinions are very important important to them. So I think that we also can't fall into this like dynamic of just assuming, oh you all are just virtue signaling or whatever. And I think a lot of people are like, these are all virtue signalers. And it's like, no, it's it's kind of complicated. It's a few like politically active extremists who are posting and they might not even be domain general extremists. They might just be someone for which a certain issue is very, very important to them. And they're very hyperactive and they're pressuring people to be like, please speak up about this issue. This is, this is so important. They're, they're more of an activist who's trying to like change the social norm. And then I think that there are virtue signals as well virtue signalers as well who tag along and are like, okay, I will post something more insincerely to go along with them. But I think we need to do mm -hmm. more research to see what the proportion of virtue signalers are in comparison to just people who view these issues very important. I, I actually think from the data I've seen that it's more probably people who are activists who view stuff as very important than virtue signalers posting. Yeah, each um, of these theories are explaining pieces of a very large complicated puzzle right right and like i think virtue signaling is absolutely real i just think it's it's sometimes overestimated there's also great work by michael bang peterson basically uh there's this common idea that going like social media often makes you like a bad person and while you might be really nice in reality you go on social media and you're like really really like mean and uncivil that's like a common theory the anonymity of social media makes you really uncivil and i think there's some truth to that theory but a lot less truth to that theory than it's actually true based on the data. What Michael Bing Peterson finds is that uncivil people, especially uncivil people who sort of have disagreeable personalities and are high in this personality trait called uh, um, like status-oriented risk-taking, I think he calls it, they are the ones who post like a bunch of the uncivil content on social media. And they, they, they're they both uncivil offline and they're uncivil online. So part of what goes on on social media is if you're a difficult person offline, people might not want to like hang out with you in reality. A lot of your friends offline might be more like agreeable people. You might not approach some of those like more disagreeable people, but those disagreeable people will have their messages widely seen and amplified by algorithms on social media. So part of this whole social media polarization thing is not just that we're stuck in echo chambers, but that we're exposed to uh, all sorts of perspectives that we might not be exposed to in reality, particularly those extreme or those uncivil or those disagreeable perspectives by people who are disagreeable or extreme offline, basically. I would have thought that the anonymity effect is quite large, especially if you're talking about like the insults that you can see thrown around on social media. It, it, could, it could just be the fact of being in a relatively nice community, but I don't see a fraction of the types of insults you see on social media in real life. And even in real life, it's like maybe you can see within a household if people are, you know, there's kind of this paradox of the more comfortable you are with someone, the nastier you can be because you know yeah. it's not going to break your relationship. But out in public, people are generally quite polite. But then on the public square of social media, 
you don't really have the same level of respect for people. Yeah, I mean, I, and I wasn't meaning to say that the anonymity effect didn't exist, but I do think it's like less large than we actually think it is. And I, I, uh -huh. I, I will say when I go on Twitter, a lot of the uncivil trolls I see on Twitter are those who are anonymous and those who don't have their name or profile attached to their actual um, account. Um, and uh, but the thing is about these sort of anonymous trolls is I think they already have some of these. There's a lot of research showing that trolls have dark triad personality traits, traits like uh -huh. not narcissism, Machiavellianism, and um, God, what's the third one? Like antagonism. Is it sadism? Yeah, sadism, basically. So they have these like dark triad personality traits. So I think it's already people who have those dispositions to be uncivil. And then I think we'll create these anonymous accounts. So again, it's this sort of interaction between like personality and environment um, and everything. And there is also research showing that political conversations between people are less productive when they happen over text. So when people are like text messaging back and forth about moral and political disagreements, th these aren't very productive. A Zoom conversation or an in-person conversation is generally very productive and people will have a lot of moral agreement and people will tend to moderate if they have a one-on-one -on -one discussion, either in person or on Zoom, they'll tend to moderate in their beliefs. This study also found, it's by Juliana Schroeder, it's a really great study, it also found that asynchronous video conversations are not productive. So if someone sends a Zoom message and then someone else replies with a Zoom message, that's not very productive It's if it's asynchronous. It sort of has to mm -hmm. happen at the same time, basically, uh, which is, you know, not very good news for TikTok where someone might post something and then someone might do a video response. It shows that that's right. not very That could be why problem. they respond badly to being <laughs> fact-checked compared to if it was during a conversation. Right. Exactly. And also those TikTok videos, as well as tweets, you're replying to the person and you're also replying to the public as well. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you're aware that everyone else is watching and you might be signaling more to your in-group than actually like trying to engage with the person. I think there's something very powerful about these sort of in-person or Zoom conversations, which which people are having less and less of, which is like sad, I, I, I guess. I mean, there's all this like John Hyde is about to come out with his book, The Anxious Generation. And there's a lot of writing about Gen Z and how they're spending more and more time on their own and they're spending more time on social media. And this is a really interesting change that is also sort of like happening at the societal and social level. And what, what's sad about it is there's not much you can even do about it as an individual. Because when there's a cultural change that's happening, and if you're like a member of Gen Z and you're like, okay, I want to spend less time on social media and more time hanging out with people in person, everyone else in Gen Z isn't hanging out with other people in person. So it's this big cultural change that is likely having negative effects. There was a study that came out just uh, recently. I just like tweeted about it yesterday that found that like, you know, uh, it replicated the common finding in psychology that in-person social interaction is beneficial for our well-being. In this study, it was an mm -hmm. experience sampling study. It also found that being on Twitter is associated with worse well-being and greater outrage. So we're on these platforms that, you know, the research suggests are associated with worse well-being, even though, you know, hanging out with other people in person is, you know, more beneficial. But it's sort of this societal decline of hanging out where it's like you can't really hang out if no one else is hanging out. So, yeah, it's, it's I think it's unfortunate. And it's also some people have talked about as well that, like, alone time has become increasingly more entertaining it's like tech companies have made it more and more entertaining mm -hmm. we have so much like netflix we have so, like we're in the golden age of television we have like these addictive social media platforms there's never been like a more entertaining time to stay at home than today but that seems to have societal declines for um our well-being even though this whole social media and well-being and generations perspective is like, you know, there's some controversy. Not everyone agrees with this perspective, but but yeah, that's what's, that's some of my speculative read of the literature. Right. And we're less comfortable with boredom now, which some people yeah. have speculated is harming our creativity. Right. Yeah. yeah. No. And it's something I noticed in myself that like we, we talked about how we listen to podcasts a lot. I don't spend a lot of time like just like walking around alone with my thoughts because I will often just be listening to a podcast um 
yeah, I, I spent much more time earlier on alone with my thoughts. So, um, yeah. There's one last big idea I want to explore mm -hmm. with you, Steve. So we've been talking as psychologists about the different cognitive and social influences that lead people to behave the way they do. So people as very active agents. And then we talked about this the first time we met, the idea of people not as active agents, but passive hosts for ideas mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. memes, sort of acting almost like pathogens and transmitting and having right. their own cultural evolution, kind of similar to natural selection in Richard Dawkins' sense of memes. So memes is an idea or packet of information that's transmitted from host to host, and it can go under random adaptation. And the memes, and you could think about this as literal internet memes, they can either become funnier or more anger inducing or more boring. And the boring ones die out. And the ones that yeah. evoke a stronger response survive and reproduce. Reproduce meaning they're shared on social media or they're transmitted across people. And the interesting thing here is that you could have a theory about that that doesn't really consider human psychology at all, that just considers humans as passive hosts, kind of in the same way that you look at bacteria spreading. It's like, we can cough and you can describe the biology of what leads to someone coughing. But for the most part, you don't need any of that information to understand how the virus spreads. Yeah, I that's super interesting. And I think the whole parasitic memes idea is a really interesting way to look at social media. And especially the term meme has popularized after like uh -huh. Dawkins sort of started talking about it and other people started talking about it. And it's now kind of meant something else. But yeah, you can think of literal memes and it seems like, again, the main currency of social media is like attention and the main thing these like memes want to do is spread from host to host. So the most contagious memes and the most contagious social media posts are the ones that will spread. And these will spread without regard to our well-being or anything else. They'll spread because of their spreadability. Something might spread because of outrage or outgroup animosity. Whereas the memes or ideas that are most productive for us might actually be very boring memes we're, we're seeking mm -hmm. out entertaining or engaging content but it might be a better place if social media is just like more boring i'm participating with some colleagues there's this like competition to design better social media algorithms and we were sort of brainstorming various ideas to make social media algorithms better i have lots of thoughts in this area and we just sort of joked about the idea, like, what if we just made an algorithm that made social media feeds much more boring so people would right. get off of social media and go into the <laughs> real world? That's not something social media platforms would actually do, but it would probably be better for our well-being. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like a tragedy of the commons because any yeah. individual social media company would benefit by increasing ad revenue and viewership. But collectively as a society, if everyone abstained from doing it, we'd all benefit. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, and there have been some recent studies that have come out that have suggested that one of the reasons people use social media is basically because of network effects. Like every, like adolescents and regular people use social media, but this seems strong for adolescents who really care about social things, is that their friends are on it. People use TikTok uh, and Instagram because their friends are on it. But the study, it was sort of an economic study that found that most, like, most people thought that the people would prefer a world in which no one was on those social media platforms. Basically, they thought these social media platforms were providing them net negative utility, but they still wanted to use them because everyone was on them and they would prefer if just they didn't exist and no one was on them. Um, so that's an interesting point. And then the point of like the social media, like corporations, um, is, uh, yeah, there's this difficult thing where social media platforms are, you know, capitalist businesses who need to create addictive products. So there's this balance between social media platforms creating, um, trust amongst their consumers. And you, you create trust through not spreading misinformation and not being too polarizing, but also being addictive. And I think there's this delicate balance. I think there are ways to improve social media algorithms that actually um, don't reduce engagement, but make the algorithms uh, better. Uh, 
So we did this big study where we had people unfollow a bunch of polarizing accounts on Twitter, like the accounts of uh, Ben Shapiro, for instance, or all these like figures who we found correlationally are associated with uh, it, people who follow these accounts tend to be more polarized. We had people unfollow a bunch of these accounts. And what we found is this decreased out party animosity, both when measured one month after the intervention was done, uh, as well as six months after the intervention was done. So it had long-term effects on people's out party animosity. It also improved the quality of news that people shared. But it didn't, we didn't find any statistically significant effect on engagement. So this change that we made didn't decrease engagement, but seemed to have benefits. People thought their feed was more positive. People thought their feed was less polarizing. And people actually got less polarizing. People posted more positive content. So this seems to be one thing that's beneficial. And I, I have to say, I think a lot of Elon Musk's changes to Twitter have not been beneficial for increasing user engagement. We've actually, we found both in our data set and a number of other people have found this, that people have used Twitter less and less once Elon Musk took it over and made all these changes. And a lot of people have reported being very unhappy with these changes. And we found in our data that people over time viewed Twitter as like more and more negative and more and more polarizing. But it's also a broader question about what Elon Musk's goals are. In some ways, I don't think his goals are to create an engaging or addictive product. Um, but to change a public conversation and shift the Overton window or whatever, because I think Elon is more Republican leaning. He probably wants to have like Trump elected. That will probably be beneficial for his businesses. And, you know, he probably he knows that taking over Twitter will change the conversation. That seems to be my read of what he's trying to do with Twitter. And he seems to have enough money that he's not quite as worried about making it. I think he's he's a bit worried about making it profitable, but that's a thing that's going on. But in cases where social media companies aren't going to change their algorithms or design changes um, to improve well-being, I, I think that's where like regulation is needed. I think one of the only ways to actually have productive changes to social media is through regulation. But um, I think recently, you know, we've seen a lot of congressional hearings about laws that could be passed to improve social media. We haven't seen a ton of them pass yet, and we haven't seen a ton of them be super successful yet. So it's been a little disappointing in terms of like whether regulation can actually be effective. And maybe one day we will design better social media regulation because uh, it seems like that's one of the only solutions. But um, but yeah, it, it hasn't been super promising so far. And it might just be that social media is such a um, new phenomena. But um, yeah. In the context I also, of... Okay. Go ahead. Go, well, I also wanted to speak on your point on cultural evolution because I think that's really uh, interesting. And I don't study cultural evolution as much, but I like know a lot of people who study cult cultural evolution and how it might interact with social media. And you would presume that social media is a huge driver of cultural evolution because like all these like cultural norms and whatever are spread across the world. And presumably social media is making the world more globalized and it's making, you know, the cultural conversation more connected toward this like global center. It's it's connecting people around the world. Facebook says its mission is connecting people around the world. I, I, I wanted to say I found a there was a finding that I found really interesting. Uh, I went to the SPSP, the social psychological and uh, the, the big social and personality psychology conference, and I saw this article presented by Professor Joshua Conrad Jackson. And he found that values across countries using the World Value Survey across the world have been diverging increasingly over time, uh, over basically the past 40 years. So this goes against this globalization narrative that like when the media and social media connects us, that we'll all sort of have this shared narrative or whatever that will become more globalized. And it's basically instead found um, that there's kind of global polarization. So this finding was like really uh, thought provoking to me and sort of suggests to me that when we think of social media and polarization, we have to move just like beyond the U.S. perspective of social media and polarization. It could be that there's polarization globally between like all these countries. And he brought he mainly found this divergence in values between sort of high income countries and sort of lower income countries. So it could be that yeah, because of the way social media is set up, it doesn't sort of bring us closer together and approach this sort of global consensus. And instead, 
pushes us as a globe, even though we're more connected, it pushes us further apart. Um, but anyway, that was a long answer. Go ahead with your question. Well, I'm thinking about all of this in the context of this virus analogy. Mm -hmm. So to your globalization point, it's like there's benefits to our interconnectedness, but also, yeah. I mean, you saw this like when we discovered the new world, right? New pathogens come over to right. populations that hadn't previously been exposed to it. And then, you know, the regulations you're mentioning, you could make an analogy here to just barring access to certain germs or improving certain hygiene practices, or like you mentioned, cleansing your feed of certain types of mm -hmm. information, being oh, analogous to like washing your hands. And then the last piece is literal inoculations like a vaccine. And I'm wondering if there have been studies showing that, let's say, controlled exposure to certain types of misinformation and then identifying it and saying, this is what fake news looks like. Does that make people in the long run better at identifying and either avoiding or knowing not to fall prey to that type of misinformation? Yeah, I mean, uh, my PhD supervisor, Sander van der Linden, has done a ton of work on what's called sort of inoculation theory about how we can inoculate people against uh, misinformation. And he uses this like very detailed vaccine metaphor. If you like give someone like like a vaccine, like a kind of a small amount of the actual misinformation virus that will inoculate them against the larger misinformation virus. He sometimes calls these inoculations uh, pre-bunking, basically. And I've been a part of um, one, maybe more, uh, but like one of the their big inoculation studies where we um, basically designed like a series of YouTube videos where we aim to inoculate people against common misinformation techniques like posting very negative and polarizing content make people aware of that and this seemed to make people better at uh, spotting the misinformation techniques and uh, we also did like a big field study with youtube where we uh like took these uh videos and put them in as youtube ads and would show them before youtube ads and we found that it, it kind of worked in the real world as well so yeah if you take this virus metaphor further and i love that you're expanding on this metaphor because um i got i got into so this is a sort of a tangent but i got into psychology partially because i loved like uh, george lakoff and conceptual metaphor theory i loved like mm -hmm. the idea that we like metaphors help us think basically so i like expanding on metaphors like this like i think it's i i just love an extended metaphor basically yeah but yeah if we if we expand on it like there are these parasitic viral memes that spread person to person and they spread regardless of they're they're often negative things spread or things that spread our well-being uh yeah there are ways to protect ourselves against these virus either by like inoculating us through these like media literacy or inoculation trainings that uh make us more aware when we see instances of these viruses or basically things uh that expose us less to our virus cleansing us uh, cleansing our social media feed and unfollowing all these people that could be like you could make that uh, like washing your hands or wearing a mask or something that's like one thing that you can do to protect yourself from the virus even sort of like entering uh your feed so yeah no i think and then i think that there are also systemic changes that can be done inside social media platforms um such as you know changing the algorithm so you don't amplify these um, types of viruses. Uh, these could be sort of likened to policy changes that can be done by uh, governments. Like you can think of like the pandemic lockdowns essentially as sort of like uh, things like that. I, I, I don't know, something like that. Um, you know, people but... say changing the algorithms as if social media companies are kind of like pulling all the strings maliciously to maximize their profits. And to some extent they are, but I wonder playing devil's advocate the algorithms are kind of a black box, right? Like yeah. you just aim to maximize engagement, but you don't necessarily even know what variables you can tweak. Yeah, like a lot of designers of these algorithms say they have no idea what's going on, on under the hood. They're basically machine learning models that are designed to like amplify stuff that will keep people on the platform and that they're likely to like and watch. But there are ways to change algorithmic inputs, basically. Uh, there's one example where this was reported in the New York Times, and I often like talk about this example because I find it very compelling about how business incentives like uh, like diverge with incentives to create a healthy environment. Basically, some internal researchers at Facebook um, 
who, by the way, internal researchers at Facebook often do amazing work that is often struck down by like higher up executives at the company. That's like a common thing that happens at Facebook and other uh, platforms um, like this. But basically, they created this machine learning classifier that would predict whether someone thought a social media post was bad for the world. So they had a bunch of people rate whether they thought posts were bad for the world. And then they created a classifier that would predict if someone thought a post was bad for the world. So for instance, like Donald Trump, like advocating for violence or saying something anti-democratic, a lot of people would think a post like that, for example, was bad for the world. And they found sort of, as you would expect, social media posts that were bad for the world were more likely to go viral. And then they sort of tried to like change their algorithm so they would downrank posts that people rated as bad for the world or that this machine learning algorithm thought, you know, rated posts as bad for the world. Um, but basically, uh, they found that implementing this change reduced engagement. So Mark Zuckerberg decided not to actually roll out this change on social media. And he said later that they, he implemented some sort of change that didn't reduce engagement. But this shows that, like, there are productive ways to change the algorithm. Mm -hmm. It's just often social media platforms won't want to do it. And also, we Facebook has publicly said that right before elections, they changed their algorithm to uprank posts from more trusted news sources as opposed to low quality or hyper partisan news sources. So they did this, for instance, before the 2020 election. But then afterward, they said, oh, we changed the algorithm back. So it's just it's uh -huh. regular. And it's like, well, why aren't you upranking? Why not do it all the time? Right. Yeah. Why don't you do this all the time? Uh, so I think there's so many examples of this. Another major thing is like upranking the angry reaction. We have found in our work that like mentions of out party animosity are associated strongly with the angry reaction on Facebook. And my colleague's work has found that instances of misinformation are associated with the angry reaction. Oftentimes, ang like political content that induces anger won't be as trustworthy or won't be as productive for conversations. But um, there was some internal uh, leaked memos that came out around uh, 2021 that essentially found that um, Facebook was like amplifying content that had the angry reaction as compared to content that received a lot of likes, basically. So specifically, they would give five posts to content that received reactions. And sorry, their internal point system for their algorithm, they did have this like internal point system that was leaked. It would give like five points to reactions on a post and it would give one point to a like, basically. And then it would also give a bunch of posts, points to comments. It would give a bunch of points to share, shares. We found, however, in my research that like angry reaction shares, comments are all more associated with out-party animosity, whereas likes are associated with in-party favoritism. So when we published this article, Outgroup Animosity Drives Virality on Social Media, we, we made the prediction that basically Facebook's decision to amplify posts containing reactions might be amplifying unproductive content containing out-party animosity. And indeed, later on, some more leaked internal memos came out from Facebook that showed that there were a lot of conversations by internal Facebook researchers showing like, yo, I don't think we should amplify this angry action. It seems to be reducing the quality of conversations. And allegedly, Facebook later decided to sort of downrank the angry reaction in their algorithm. But again, this is all through like leaked memos. So we don't fully, there's not a lot of transparency about how Facebook's algorithm worked besides some of these internal conversations and leaked memos. memos. Uh, allegedly, Elon Musk sort of like open sourced the Twitter algorithm. So he showed this big like GitHub thing about how the Twitter algorithm worked. But it was actually very hard to like parse how this worked because you couldn't really read the code without having access to the model. You would you would kind of need to know how this model worked and sort of play with it with this code about all these inputs and whatever to understand the algorithm. So. Elon Musk was like, we have a lot of transparency. Here's the algorithm. But like he gave us this code that was basically like very useless um, to read. So I appreciate all the nuance here because we're seeing some genuine cause for concern, but also at least proof of concept that this problem is solvable. It's kind of a general take home message. Like we talked about it earlier with the sort of climate crisis and talking about people becoming lonelier, but also spending more time on social media and becoming more interconnected globally, like benefits and costs on both ends that need to be balanced. Right. Yeah. And I think 
one thing that social media companies can do to make this problem more solv solvable is to actually share data with researchers, which social media companies so often don't do. They're often adversarial to researchers. They're a little bit, uh, many people have compared social media platforms to um, sort of these big tobacco companies that were like, oh, ignore all this research showing that tobacco like and cigarette smoking uh, causes cancer. That's not another true. public health analogy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. And people have criticized this analogy and with analogies, they're always imperfect. Uh, but and social media is probably a more complex thing than cigarette smoking, which I think is just like bad for health, basically. So, yeah, it's an imperfect analogy, but I think it's largely true that social media platforms have been very adversarial with researchers. Let's uh, look at, for instance, um, Facebook sort of wrote a statement about my research and trying to say that my research was about how group animosity was simply wrong and that social media doesn't cause polarization. And Facebook is often in response to articles written about uh, Facebook that have been slightly negative about the company. Facebook will write press releases that try to attack the researchers. So they've been oh, that's so meta and I just recognized that their their company name is now called meta but like yeah you're, they're they're acting on the very negative negativity bias that you outlined because they, they probably don't really comment as an organization on anything positive or neutral no no that's very true yeah exactly they're playing into this negativity bias um but uh yeah and then Facebook doesn't really share data with researchers like they're they're very and they'll often make excuses like, oh, researchers won't respect privacy. But, you know, there are ways to respect privacy. And obviously their employees have um, access to data and there are ways to sort of protect people's privacy. And also it, it seems like the privacy thing is an excuse. There was also this major Facebook did this big project with researchers around the 2020 election where they did all these studies in collaboration with researchers. But that was a very sort of one time limited thing where they specifically selected a few researchers. Also, uh, for, let's go to Twitter now. Twitter, now called X, they used to have, they used to be one of the most transparent companies in terms of sharing data with researchers. They had this great API, the Twitter API that I would use all the time for my research. Um, but Elon Musk, when he joined the company and called it X, he shut it down. Um, now there's this whole thing where there was this regulation passed in Europe called the Digital Services Act or the DSA. has basically mandated that researchers get access to data so they can study systemic risks of social media platforms to the European Union, such as the spread of social uh, misinformation on social media. So basically, this very cool and successful regulation was passed that would mandate data access to researchers. And that was very, very exciting when that was passed. It's like, okay, this is actually a great um, template for other regulations to be passed, for instance, in the United States, that mandate data access to researchers. Because again, I think one of the major ways we can improve social media is through independent researchers understanding social media and mandating data access. Uh, so to, to give a little bit more of a story here, X sort of opened up uh, to comply with the Digital Services Act. They opened up an application for researchers to apply for data access through their API, which they had basically shut down. They actually hadn't shut it down. They made it prohibitively expensive. So it's $42,000 a month if you want full access to the Twitter wow. API, which researchers can't afford. Um, but... Uh, so myself and a number of other researchers applied to for data access uh, through X or Twitter through their new application. My application was denied. Every single researcher I've talked to has had their application denied. So it seems like X, uh, you know, I, I think they're putting up a lot of guardrails and they don't want, they want to make it very, very hard for, uh, for X or Twitter, for, for researchers to access their data. So while this big regulation was passed that mandated data access, it seems like it might take a while for that to actually be enforced or for data to actually realistically end up in the hands of researchers. I think that social media platforms will put up every sort of roadblock they can to not have researchers access yeah. their data. Unfortunately, well, if it is like the tobacco analogy, at least yeah. in decades, even if it takes decades, it'll, it'll probably work out. Fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, hopefully. I mean, there's also this other thing about um, 
social media platforms have realized that their data is more valuable because they can use it to train AI models. Mm -hmm. And I know Reddit is now like selling its data to an AI model or whatever. And I think a major reason why, yeah. sorry, why X shut down Twitter access, API access is they wanted to train their own AP AI model. So I think we're in a new world where data on the internet won't be as free and people will be much more protective of data on the internet because we're in this big race to create the best AI model. Um, but I think we need to create an exception for researchers that I will always like repeat this point about data access for researchers because I think that's really like step one into creating reasonable regulations. There are just really so many unknowns, unfortunately, about how social media affects us. And there are so many conflicting results about how social media impacts our well-being and polarization. And part of the reason for the unknowns is lack of access to data. And I think when the research is uncertain and when the research is unknown, this plays into the hands of social media companies who can be like, look, the research is uncertain. It's unknown. We really don't know how social media impacts us. So let's not take action here. Um, so that's kind of why we need to like have, do some good research so we can take informed action. And also, I think if the research is unknown, we can take action based on the best available data. I think there's some solidly good available data that suggests that social media amplifies negativity and out-party animosity and is harmful for the well-being of adolescent girls. I think some of the data is starting to be very solid on this mm -hmm. issue, at least, you know, in the United States. We can talk globally. There's a lot less research there, but from the United States where a lot of the research has been done, some of it is starting to be solid. So I think in cases where there's not full uncertainty, you can always like move forward with the best available data you have. Thank you, Steve, for elucidating all of that complexity and helping navigate this uncertainty. Yeah, thank you for the fabulous questions. This was a really fun conversation. So thanks again for the invite. Likewise, thank you.